we can look even more in this. This, this is a tree diagram uh, that, remember Mark Ribbons, he said that do, he asked, do we share ancestry with other organisms? And the answer, of course, is yes. This is not a subject under debate anymore. Uh, this is a radial diagram of the tree of life. So what you see here, illustrated here, is uh, the center is long ago. That's four billion years ago, roughly the origin of life. And as you go farther out radially, what you are doing is you're getting younger and younger and younger. And in this diagram, you cannot read it because that, you see that kind of gray fringe all around there? Those are the Latin names of 3,000 species of organisms who had their ribosomal RNA sequenced and used to, de to determine their relationship, to discover who they were most closely related to. And all that's put together in this lovely, lovely complicated diagram. Again, 3,000 species is not much. 3,000 species is about 0.18% uh, of the current extent biodiversity. So we're looking at a tiny fraction and you have to reduce it so much that you can't even read it anymore. Uh, point being though that all of us are equally evolved that this, is, this circular diagram neatly makes this point. Uh, we're up there in the top left, around about 11 o'clock or so. That's, it says you are here, right there. That's, that's, that's uh, Homo sapiens. We're all just as evolved. We've all been around. Our lineage has been around just as long as every other lineage on the planet. So we're all the same there, and we are all related to each other. So yes, that little bacterium that's floating around this room proudly thinking that it's been built just for him, we're related. Now we can zoom in ourselves. I know, I know you, this is what you want to do because humans aren't very important in the grand scheme of things, but one thing we are is very self-important. So if we just zoom in on the part that illustrates us, there, there we are, you can see the bits and pieces of the, of the branching diagram. Uh, and what you've discovered there in this particular diagram, because it's only a subset of all the species out there, uh, we're flanked by a mouse and an amphibian. And obviously the amphibian is superior because if you chop off his legs, he will grow them back and we will not. <laughs> so this is where you stand. You're one of millions. No more favored by any objective process than any of the other creatures on this diagram. Uh, and every one of the creatures illustrated here is a winner that has won the evolutionary sweepstakes over the past four billion years, which is pretty impressive. Now, one other thing we can do is, is this is a diagram that was generated by just looking at one particular kind of very common DNA, the ribosomal RNA, the small subunit of the, of the ribosomal RNA, or DNA. And we can compare those sequences because all these creatures have them. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can start looking at what's going on inside of our cells. And this is where intelligent designers love to make up stories. And that's because if you look inside of a cell, what you discover is all kinds of complexity. It's a very complex setup that we've got here. And what's, uh, what I've illustrated here is, uh, Oh, a simple diagram, you can all, you can all figure that out, right? Uh, what we're looking at here is a photoreceptor, a cell that receives light from its environment and takes that light and through a chain of chemical reactions mediated by various proteins inside the cell, it translates it into a change in the electrical potential across the cell membrane which can be conducted back into the brain. So this is going on right now in all of your retinas. There's little photoreceptors like these collecting light going through these complicated chemical reactions that are involving things like phospholipase C and opsin and all these, and G proteins and so forth, and turning that into an electrical signal that goes back into your brain and gets translated by the circuitry of your brain and you perceive something, which is pretty impressive. And this is what science is really good at. It's teasing apart relationships. It's getting into these cells and asking, okay, what's there? How do they work together? And furthermore, we can use evolutionary theory to ask, okay, where did it come from? And we can do comparisons. And that's what this diagram is also showing. Uh, what you see there in, in all those complicated tree diagrams is these, the various components, uh, the various protein components of this particular process worked out for different organisms. And we know how they're all related to each other. And what you find when you see these kinds of, kinds of diagrams is that we mammals have circuitry in our eyes, chemical circuitry, it's just like what you find in a fruit fly. We're all united. This is something we all hold in common. So again, that, that common ancestry thing is really, really important. Now, we could right now stage a little coup and I could take over this entire 
meeting room for a couple more days remaining and we could have a graduate level seminar in sensory photo transduction. If you all agreed. <laughs> the, 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 oh. the other speakers might kill me. So maybe we won't, but I'm just telling you that that the level of knowledge we have about these kinds of things is immense. We know all this wonderful, marvelous stuff that we teach in the, in the universities to our students and that then hopefully then they go out and teach to others as well. But we know so much about what's going on in here. Uh, however, you know, if, if you look at this stuff and then you go to your holy books and ask where is it, it isn't there that we can safely say that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. That this philosophy or this religion is a tiny subset of reality. And if you want to get at all the real stuff out there, uh, this, the toolkit you're going to use is called science. This is what science does. Is it exposes all the stuff that aren't in the holy books. Now, you know, if, if I ask you where it is in the holy books, you're all saying, nah, it's not there. And if you, if you weren't a gang of vicious, rabid atheists, uh, if you were a bunch of believers, you might make a very reasonable reply, and a re re reply I would agree with, and then you'd say, uh, that's not supposed to be in the book. That's not what the book is about. The Bible is not about this. So it's perfectly natural that the book of Genesis has absolutely nothing on G proteins. It makes it kind of a boring book. But, you know, okay, there are other things that people can think about. So, yeah, and, and that would be an entirely reasonable answer. They would say, no, that's not right, that the Bible is not a science textbook. To which I would say, exactly, we are in agreement. So why are you telling me that I must constrain science education to that which uh, does not defy your religious teachings. Because what we've got here is a case where there's a whole bunch of stuff in science that is either orthogonal to what's taught in the, in the, text, in the holy books, which is the most charitable interpretation I can make of this, or it's directly contradicting what's in the holy books. That what science is telling us, for instance, is that we're all related to one another. And that's not what the book says. So there's something wrong and something has to give. So if you're willing to say that the, book, that the Bible is a book of metaphors that you can use to guide your life in, in its morals, which I would disagree with, but not in this context, um, I would say, OK, go with it. Now leave me alone. We've got to teach science. And we are all going to be atheists while we do it. Here's another pretty picture. Uh, and again, it's telling you something about the, these, these deep patterns in how you are built. Uh, your eye is not just complicated. It's not just full of little molecular details, but it's really, really old. Again, we scientists know this stuff. Isn't this cool? Go to the science, science journals, go to the textbooks, and you'll discover that this, this is pretty impressive. The vertebrate eye that you guys are using right this minute uh, uses a pattern of cellular, cellular organization that was formulated at least 500 million years ago. Our vertebrate ancestors, our little fishy ancestors, worked all this stuff out, uh, built this molecular toolkit. Well, actually, the molecular toolkit was there even longer. It was, it was at least 600 million years old. Uh, and it's, it's saying that it's, it's all there. All these pieces were put together way back then. And we've done almost nothing to improve on it. We've changed little things, but nothing significant since those primitive fish. Uh, I, I suppose some of you may have noticed that there is a mermaid in the picture. Uh, this paper is not arguing for the existence of mermaids. Uh, what it's doing is it's making the point that the eyes of fishes and men are pretty much equivalent. At this level, when you look at the cells and you look at the molecules, uh, just forget those differences. We have, we have the eyes of fish, and fish have the eyes we have. Uh, it's, it's, they're, they're so similar in structure. So what this is telling us is, again, something that, that religious people don't like. Uh, we are cousins to hagfish. We are the children of worms. And some people find that extremely disturbing. Of course, scientists find that idea so much more inspiring than this false notion that we are special little children of a deity who loves us. Uh, a, deity, a deity who tells the chosen species, that's us, a selective truth about their existence, and uh, doesn't even mention cephalopods or cephalochordates in his holy book. 
And he's also pushing a set of doctrines that can be falsified by anyone willing to open their eyes and look around. This is what scientists are, is they're just like religious people, except those eyes there, we use them. <laughs> we do not have them clamped tightly shut. So let me just, just finalize this by saying, you know, why, why does science education need us atheists? And there's a couple of reasons here. These are the major ones. But first of all is, is honesty. If you're going to be honest about the science, you do not want to be one of those devious, lying, deceptive seducers. I've always wanted, I, I've, I've always done my seduction with myself, presented honestly, and it works. You can ask my wife. <laughs> We've been married for over 30 years, and, and she has discovered absolutely no surprises that I kept from her uh, before that, that wedding. So, you know, this is the same thing. With our students, if we want them to believe what we're going to say, we have to believe it ourselves. We have to have an honest appreciation of the actual facts and the actual evidence. Uh, the other important thing is clarity. Unlike Ken Miller, I don't need to muck up that pretty story of the evolution of the eye by saying that there's an invisible man in the sky who has occasionally reached down and diddled it in order to make it work. No, we know how it works. We know the machinery of the eye. We know the processes that build an eye. Similarly, we, we, we have to maintain integrity. That I'm not going to go into the classroom and tell my students, well, today I will be a Christian for you because you're all Christians and you might like me better. That's not an honest approach to the science either. Uh, I do have students who resent the fact that here I am, godless atheist, talking to them about science. And they don't trust me as much for that reason. But I, I think they would trust me even less if I lied about my motivations. And of course, we, we've got to be open about everything. One of the things I really dislike about the education system in the United States right now is that public school teachers can be fired for being atheists. It's considered moral turpitude. You're the kind of rascal we don't want our kids exposed to. And they will actually fire people who don't go to church. So what do a lot of teachers do? Uh, if if there, there are many teachers who are in these kinds of repressive school districts who have to simply lie their entire life, is that a good thing to do to a human being? I do not think so. Besides, you know, uh, there's always this possibility that we're going to be regarded as militant atheists, but you see the difference here. There's, there's a militant Islamist, there's a militant Christianist, and yes, you guys, we all fit that description right there, don't we? <laughs> kind of nerdy, we like our coffee, or tea, whatever, uh, but a militant atheist seems that we, militancy suddenly has a very different def definition than it does when you apply it to an atheist. It's somebody who likes to read and write books, uh, who likes to talk, and who likes to argue. Isn't that a shame? So anyway, let me, let me just, last slide, I just want to show you one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite people. Uh, this is a guy named Charles Darwin, who in his book is, is writing about this difficult theory he has, this idea that, that species can change, that forms can change into and other forms over many generations of time. And right off the bat, he's going to tell you, don't, don't start invoking gods for this. That's what he's saying right there at the top. It's, it's so easy to hide our ignorance under su such expressions as the plan of creation or unity of design. And he's right that these are, these are weasel words. These are ways to fudge around the actual problems. And what he's saying is, OK, uh, what I'm hoping is that there will be a few of you out there who will pay attention to what I say, to what the evidence is. And he, in particular, he talks about the importance of recruiting young people to his ideas about changes, changing forms. And he wants people to question the idea that he, he wants both sides to be addressed. He wants people to talk about creationism. He wants people to talk about evolution and find the truth between them. And the key sentence here is, is the one I put in bold, that the way to do this is you do good service by conscientiously expressing your conviction that this is ultimately our goal as atheists, as humanists, as agnostics, is that we are going to refuse to hide our beliefs. We're going to come out with them. And we're going to say why they're important. We will conscientiously express our convictions that there is no God and that people are better off getting rid of him.